Lovely to see everyone here today. Um, this is like an amazing panel of incredibly uh, smart and um, accomplished humans. So it's a true, true pleasure to be doing this. Uh, so I'm gonna just jump right into it. Um, I'm gonna start off by asking you, Alan, uh, can you give us an overview of the core challenges of the current system for measuring climate impact? 100% in Web3 especially. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot going on. Um, so ultimately, when you are, when you have an organization or when you have a, say you have a factory or you have a product and you're trying to measure its environmental impact, if it's centralized, if you have total control over that, that product and how it's made, then there's a lot of information that you have about exactly what goes into it what the electricity use is, what the electricity mix is. Uh, you may be able to put solar cells on your factory and then you know that that energy is being renewable generated. There's a ton of data and a ton of interventions that you can make directly if you have total control over that product that you just don't have in a Web3 system. And so this was when we started uh, Filecoin Green, which is the sustainability initiative for Filecoin, this was one of the major challenges that we faced, is that sort of in Web3 systems, Filecoin, for example, was growing really, really fast. It was getting, it, you know, it got to 10 exabytes uh, super, super uh, speedily. And we knew that people all over the world were running uh, running the network in these data centers. We had some idea from their IP addresses where they were. Obviously, that's not like perfect information, and so we came up with some strategies to try to figure out where these actual nodes are. And then the, the next step, right, was to try to understand what we can tell about the amount of energy that was used to run Filecoin based on just the proofs that all of these nodes submit to the chain. And so we did years of research. So we, we sent surveys to storage providers, we did interviews with storage providers, we worked really closely with the, the actual proofs team, we looked at benchmarks, we did a ton of work to try to figure out for every storage proof that you submit to the chain to onboard data or seal data and increase the, the committed capacity or the, the storage capacity of the Filecoin chain, how much energy does it actually take to do that? So for every proof, we could say, okay, we think that this CPU ran for six hours, this GPU ran for you know, three hours in order to produce this proof. And then we could sort of back out based on our assumptions about hardware, what the, what the energy use was. Yeah. Then we, the, the next step was, okay, then say, if they're pulling energy from the grid, we can try to understand what the emissions are associated with that. And then the, the next step, which we've made a lot of progress on and are continuing to push really hard on, is to allow storage providers themselves, if they are taking interventions, so say they're putting solar on their roof, say they're using liquid cooling so their data center is much more efficient, if they're taking any of these interventions to try to reduce their environmental impact, allow them to prove that through this series of mechanisms and then incorporate that into our, our um, our estimates, yeah, um, and then of course tie that to incentive mechanisms. So that's that's sort of you know you asked for an overview. That's that's a really kind of kind of broad overview, um, but ultimately it stems from the fact that all of these Web three systems are are very different from like a traditional company in terms of what information you have access to. That's amazing work, amazing work making these ESG systems verifiable in a decentralized world. Uh, next, I want to kick it over to you, Vitaly. Uh, can you tell us about Boosty Lab's progress in supply chain tracking solutions and what kind of measurable impact it has on ESG reporting? Yeah, sure. Like Boosty Labs, we are uh, consulting in this space from 2019, and we uh, used to work with a lot of big companies. And I think currently, like supply chain track and trace, is one of the eldest enterprise uh, case in the market started from the IBM food chain for the Chinese meat uh, in road to the US. And uh, we had a chance to collaborate as a boosty with Vodafone on the building uh, digital asset broker, uh, which helps to connect security, se security from the blockchain to the IoT devices and provide for the logistic companies a small device which extends the transparency and traceability for the customers. And now in the market, we have, based on the Boosty experience, we see uh, two ways how companies uh, start to execute uh, truck and trace. First, it's about the 
customer transparency. Uh, mostly it's in the luxury brands, uh, medical, uh, cosmetics uh, industries. Uh, they utilizing usually like uh, public blockchains with the shared data, everything to approve. And another side of the market, it's the companies which extending their um, accountability and auditability. Uh, to cut their costs. Usually this company choose Hyperledger or Corda R3, more private solutions, which works uh, only for the internal access. Amazing, I mean, so great. Uh, next I'm gonna ask you, David. Gainforest is actually one of the OG file grantees. Um, it's a, a project that I talk about a lot that I think is really excellent you know, validation and use of blockchain technology for true, true social good. Um, would you talk about uh, how you're bringing decentralized tech and AI together to support biodiversity initiatives? Totally, and first of all, thank you so much for that compliment. Um, we really appreciate the Falcon ecosystem a lot. Um, Gainforce Earth pays communities, local communities in the rainforest and coastal communities in, in Southeast Asia, in, in Kenya, and in South America. That's 28 communities we're working right now. We pay them um, incentives and money for data collection. We pay them one cent per minute of bioacoustic recording. So these are, I brought a bioacoustic sensor here. These are small sensors you can install into the forest. It listens 24 seven for three weeks, of, like everything you can hear about the forest. Every bird sound, every insect sound, every frog sound, every bat sound. Um, also, it can also hear when nothing happens. So AI is really, really great in distinguishing and analyzing what we call soundscapes to give you a score of biodiversity health. Um, by itself, a really fascinating topic. But we also um, pay five cents per megabyte of drone data, and we pay 20 cents per tree image that communities go out and collect. And all of this data um, by itself is really useful for AI. Our first large grant we got from MIT to collect a very, very large carbon market calibration data set for satellite-based algorithms, where we collected 10,000s of data points in the southern Philippines. And this data set is very special. Um, this data set basically empowered a lot of communities to learn about this technology, become data collector, data validators, and also some of them became data analysts. So it's like, went all the value chain from a local community member to actually someone who's connected to the digital economy. We believe it's a huge opportunity for these communities to get rewards from the digital economy, um, as an alternative income source towards sustainable uh, practices. But not only that, that data set has a really, really special story because we collected it two years ago for science, and a couple of months ago, we overlaid it with satellite data. We have a collaboration with Planet Labs to receive monthly satellite images, and we saw that a certain kind of part of that forest, it turned from green to brown, and we were like curious what happened there. Um, we requested a drone image um, from the communities to take over that area, and we saw that there was a truck destroying forest, cutting down mangroves, which was wow. illegal. When the NGO confronted the mayor of this little town, the mayor said, no, that's not true. The mangroves have been already like this the whole time, right? But because we collected yeah. decentralized data like two years ago, because we have the overlaying time series image from satellite data, because we have AI to analyze exactly how many trees are now missing, like the, and that NGO could go one level step higher and um, confront the govern local governments and municipality through the Department of um, Environment of the Philippines, and now he actually has to act. So decentralized data storage and decentralized data is not only important for science, it's important for climate justice, for environmental protection, but it also provides an alternative income source to local communities, and feel this is a really promising area. Incredible. Can, can I make a, make a data uh, absolutely. point that yes. sort of like brings yes. both of these together? Totally. Um, I, I mean, I think that the um, you know, what you were talking about with IoT sensors, yeah. right, is I, I was talking a bit about the different types of data sets that we can have in order to verify environmental impact. And getting direct data from a smart meter or an IoT sensor in this, like, data stream over time, that is the, you know, sort of top level, like, type of data set and degree of granularity that yeah. you could have if you want to actually verify, um, verify emissions, say. Right, and um, then at the same time, you have these data sets that um, Gainforest has been doing an amazing job collecting uh, in partnership with local communities, right? And that data then, again, 
fits into this sort of larger superstructure that is, again, enabled by Web3 and things like Filecoin and IPFS in order to trace that, um, the, the use of that data from initial raw data collected by local communities, things like you've worked with this great group called Oceanus in the Philippines in order to, to plot mangrove trees, then say that data is used in a training model and that training model has value because say that's the best model in the world for um, analyzing the actual tree crowns of, of this particular type of forest, right? Um, so I, I think like in, you know, this, this group really sort of pulls together this um, this thread of like, what is the potential of Falcon and IPFS to collect data relevant to sustainability? And because everything is content addressed, because everything is immutable and verifiable, we're able to really um, add a richness and depth to the data underlying our sustainability claims that is, is like very difficult to do in the, the sort of legacy Web2 world. I love that pulling it all together. Um, and actually, pulling it together to piggyback off your point earlier around energy consumption and verifiable energy consumption, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the perception that Web3 disproportionately impacts the energy sector. And I wanted to ask Vitaly, can you actually talk about how blockchain tech is making positive changes for global energy usage, rather than the usual narrative that we hear about how much of an energy suck it is? Yeah. Uh Definitely like uh, we see on the market a uh, very huge explosion of the ESG compliance uh, from the uh, sustainability perspective. Mm -hmm. Filecoin doing a very great job on this, and especially Filecoin itself was the founded for the uh, sustainability of the storage. Uh, it's a very good point because like uh, cloud providers like AWS, GCP, Azure, they every year extend their capability, extend their revenues, but not thinking about sustainability and updating of their own um, storages, uh, mm -hmm. data centers, everything. And uh, there are on the market very cool blockchains which help industries uh, to cut their computing power, decentralized storage power, uh, possibilities, especially like uh, in Filecoin, we are working with Akava, which helps uh, with S3 compatible layer on top of the Filecoin to provide the same experience for the enterprises as they have uh, using the cloud providers. And it helps uh, with adoption of the technology to the tier one, tier two enterprises because uh, it's where we have the main energy point, it's utilization of the huge data centers. Yeah. And uh, to cut it to the more local level, to the local firms directly without the ad adding uh, in the cycle as a cloud provider, it's one of the most powerful things uh, currently on the market uh, based on the everything decentralized. The pin uh, will cut this world in five years. Yeah. Um, Alan, I know you already talked some about this, but do you have anything more that you want to add about how Filecoin is actually increasing the ability to have verification of energy usage on Web3? Yeah, 100%. So, um, I mean, one of the things I want to give a huge shout out to a company called Nova Energy, which was spun out of Filecoin Green and is handling a lot of this. And I think one of the things that they're doing really effectively is breaking this binary between data that is totally public and totally verifiable versus data that is totally private and not verifiable at all, right? And if we are stuck with only that binary, that's a really bad place to be for sustainability because a lot of this data, say, you know, when you, when you work with you know, factories that have IoT data, that data is extremely, extremely sensitive for this, this company. Right. If you are doing something energy intensive, say, publishing just you know with with a huge amount of granularity your like energy use over the course of the day is going to give your competitors an advantage. Right. So we can't actually like start from the point of view of making everything like totally totally open and public if we are are working with private businesses that just like can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, what Nova Energy is doing is working with a lot of these storage providers, uh, both in Filecoin and also nodes in other, um, other networks, and I believe also some, some work with AI models, and allowing those companies to submit data 
and go through a process of, of validation and verification, ultimately like allowing you to kind of break that trade-off and allow really good high quality data sets in order to understand what the energy use is from a Filecoin storage provider, for example, because if we don't have that data, we have these really high error bars, right, mm -hmm. for our, our model. If you go to Filecoin.energy, yep. you can look for individual storage providers and see like the, the error bars on what we can just get from uh, on-chain proofs are, are pretty high. But um, they're able to collect more sort of robust and granular sources of data and handle that in a way that is responsible and also gives visibility into the, uh, the energy consumption and environmental impact. Incredible. Um, and actually, just piggybacking on that, Alan, the problem of data verification uh, that has pervaded the scientific research community uh, not only impacts results uh, and progress, but also, I mean, fundamental trust in science and the scientific process. Can you talk a little bit about Charity and how it's restoring trust in science? Yeah, 100%. So I recently spun a company out of Protocol Labs with my amazing co-founder, Caitlin, uh, that's building a product called Churdy. Churdy is, is doing exactly what you, what you just described. So we're building a global operating system for science that is based on Filecoin and IPFS. And the idea here is that scientists need more interconnected tools in order to make their research easier to verify, easier to replicate. You may have heard about the replication crisis in science that is relevant to reproducing an experiment, but it's also relevant to actually just like trying to take a scientific paper and just run the same code on the same data and get the same result, um, which is a little bit mind boggling. There was a, there was a study done that showed that for a, a <laughs> upsettingly large fraction of scientific papers that that wasn't actually possible like you couldn't just download the the data that they they claimed to have had and like run the same analysis and get the same result in it um, so Trudy exists to try to solve that and so you can go to Trudy.io and uh, look at the the product that we have right now um, which is a data management tool and code management tool meant to make science more interoperable and so there's a bunch of different applications of this. One is to, to make the lives of individual scientists sort of easier and faster, make it easier to build on the work of other scientists. And then a big part of, of what we're going after also in, in collaboration with, with Gainforest is allowing you to take interesting and sensitive and um, important data sets and either publish them totally publicly or publish encrypted versions of them, um, plug them into code that you can, again, publish either totally open or publish an encrypted version, and then let people use that pipeline. So let people swap data sets in and out, let people rerun that pipeline, and either do it for free or do it while compensating, say, the indigenous people and local communities that provided those data sets. And so all of this comes back to ultimately the, the kind of beauty of content addressing, um, which is, I, I like to think of it as a universal coordinate system for data. So a, a content address is, is the basis of Filecoin and the basis of IPFS, um, where we address data based on what it is, using its digital fingerprint, rather than where it is. Um, and again, that, that just like, that primitive of this sort of deep universal verifiability of data sets is sort of at the root of everything that we do. And I understand that Gainforest has already put Charity into action. Uh, David, would you talk a little bit about this collaboration? Yeah, totally. It's something we're really proud of. But maybe first the setting. So um, I'm a recovering academic. I've spent <laughs> most of my career in science and academia, receiving a PhD at prestigious universities. But I decided science is not a good place to be done in academia. It's a much better place to be done in Web3. So decentralized science, I think, is one of the most hopeful movements that we have currently in our ecosystem. And decentralizing data allows us to create decentralized science in a much more effective way. Decentralizing data infrastructure, research tools, I think enables everyone to become a scientist. And we wanted to prove a point. Five years ago, there was an um, X prize announced for the rainforest, a $10 million prize, um, where 300 teams around the world, mostly prestigious institutions, like um, Duke University, Yale University, other universities joining in to basically compete on measuring rainforest using scientific methods within 24 hours and analyzing the data in 48 hours. We at Gainforce decided to approach a different solution. We thought about, is there a way to not leverage existing scientific expertise, but decentralizing science and allowing local committee members to become the analysts, the scientists, the data collectors themselves with the technology and the incentives that we are right now discussing here. 
So moving fast forward, we were like 300 teams. Then in the semifinals, we were 16 teams. Now th this finals, we are 16. So we're the only team left standing that was doing decentralized science as a solutions concept to this approach. And we used Charity to basically create easier scientific methods, analyze these results in a reproducible way, but also, as Alan importantly said, to trace back who has collected this data point, who should get rewarded, to really benefit everyone that is involved in, in the value chain of science itself. And yeah, we, we've done really well, so uh, yeah. cannot announce anything um, until 15th of November, but I think it shows that this decentralized science approach mm -hmm. is, an, is the first really, really strong alternative towards academia and producing scientific knowledge. And I think we are like in a new kind of era of how we can produce science at scale that is also fair and equitable. And that is thanks to the technology that we're discussing here. That's a really, really important cornerstone. Yeah. I'm so excited to hear how you, how you guys did on the, on the 15th. I know. I'm, I know we don't know anything until the 15th, but I think it would be completely game-changing uh, to have something like, you know, Gain Forest, be able to use Web3 technology to elevate um, the way that we're able to do Rainforest. And if you just think about the effect that the XPRIZE has had on uh, space and space exploration um, over the last, what, 20 years since that originally, since that original XPRIZE happened, if you can conceptualize that happening for Rainforest technology, I think we'd be in an amazing place in the next 20 years. So. Uh, fingers crossed, and I look forward to hearing uh, what happens on the 15th. Well, there is, I think, a common theme, um, an undercurrent through all of your projects of community and collaboration, uh, shared responsibility and trust. And I'd love to add, ask each of you guys about the importance of incorporating these values when it comes to preservation of our planet and how each of you think about this. Yeah. I think so that uh, blockchain's concept as DAO uh, helps the, engage the communities to the uh, project itself, to the ecosystem, and it's the power of Web3. It's uh, the community uh, responsibility of every step of the companies, and like Filecoin is a very good example of it because uh, the ecosystem is growing very fast by community now. Like last two years, Filecoin ecosystem from the adoption and product perspective grows too fast. <laughs> I can say, <laughs> time to time, you don't can catch the amount of the projects which are developed in the Filecoin ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, but also, it uh, provides us possibility uh, for the more transparency from the company management perspective, uh, because uh, it's a uh, uh, psychology, sustainability of the company where your employees I have everything very transparent, like startup mood, which Netflix has uh, its unique case for Web2 market. But in Web3 market, like most of companies are transparent with uh, all of their consumers, employees, uh, and users. Mm. Alex, yeah. Right? yeah. A few different thoughts. Uh, one is just sort of the, about the nature of emergent behavior and how it applies to Web3, and that we've had so much sort of success in building these systems where the system has some particular goal, right? And in the case of Filecoin, that's to, to store a lot of data and store that reliably in a decentralized way. And you're really able to you know, translate that goal into this, this set of primitives that are sort of game theoretically sound. And then you, you have this, this behavior, which is this, this useful set of work that the network does that, that emerges from the behavior of all those community members. And you're able to you know, specify that rigorously so that you can be confident what kind of behavior is going to emerge from that. And so that's, that's sort of way on the totally decentralized sort of end of the spectrum, right? Which is in contrast to, I think, the, the much more you know, sort of centralized institutions that we've, we've spent a long time as, as people uh, sort of living inside. And I, I really, you know, I think part of how we think about community and community engagement is really where on that spectrum do you want to end up for the type of work that you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so we've talked about data management and, you know, again, sort of an analogous spectrum from like totally open to totally closed. And for sustainability data, you want some amount of verifiability, and maybe you want ZK verifiability, maybe you want 
um, you know, all these other tools that allow you to like hit positions on that spectrum that you wouldn't yeah. be able to hit before. And there's a, there's a totally analogous thing also for data sovereignty and control um, and this trade-off, this set of trade-offs between transparency and, um, and uh, uh, sort of, uh, I guess, you know, data sovereignty, right? Um, that really hits the open science movement and is, is very involved yeah. in the open science movement. I think that you know, there were these fair principles that were developed for dealing with scientific data sets where um, the open science community decided that there were these certain parameters that data, scientific data should follow and they were really organized around making that data open and accessible and easy to access. And what they found was that when they tried to apply that to certain types of research in certain types of communities, again going back to especially indigenous people and, and local communities, that they you know, didn't, they weren't gonna participate if that, if that data was, was totally, you know, was totally open with no safeguards mm -hmm. for um, that, that community to still have sovereignty over that data. Yeah. Um, so they developed these care principles that are sort of a, a supplement that ensures that uh, people actually do own their data and have control over it. And I think like, especially the, the set of, of tools that we have in the Falcon ecosystem really allows us to tune that well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, the sort of thing that we're applying in Trudy. David, love your thoughts too. I think, first of all, I really like, I really want to highlight that community engagement is super central towards anything, any value that we create in the ecosystem, simply because of combinatorics. If you look at the value of a data point, a single data point is not worth a lot. Like, as you gather a critical mass of data, more applications are getting accessible, like AI training, large language model training. Um, and that same thing is, um, we can also see in our ecosystem where different kind of chains, different kind of players, different kind of like profits and non-profit and uh, for-profit startups are experimenting and trying out and um, innovating the space, right? And now, for example, we have um, method mechanisms where we can fund public goods um, that traditionally were not fundable, like open source software, but these same kind of strategies now, if we can connect data and science to the mechanisms we just invented for public goods could be used to fund science itself, right? So yeah. all of these are composable blocks. That's how we see it. That's why community is so important. All of these are composable blocks that once you create these atomic pieces, you can use combinatorics to just imagine a new future with all different kind of possibilities where you connect all the dots together. And I think that's really, really important to, for us as a space to keep innovating, to keep funding these things. And uh, I think this is um, by itself what decentralizing data stands for. Well, I just want to thank you guys all so much. I think this has been incredibly insightful um, and a great way to look at you know the ways that blockchain technology is increasing verifiability with with ESG, with science, uh, and with you know making our world at large more. Um, verifiable and increasing the rate of scientific progress. And it's been a true and true and real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.